afternoon, everyone. My name is Tremaine Palmer with the California Department of Social Services, and this is a caregiver webinar series. And today's topic is going to be educational rights. This webinar is brought to you by California Department of Social Services in partnership with the California Alliance of Caregivers. Just some logistics of how today's meeting is going to go. This webinar is being recorded and will be available at www.cacaregivers.org forward slash webinars. If you would like a certificate of attendance, please email your request to info at cacaregivers.org as listed in the chat and participants have the ability to speak. So please submit your questions to the Q&A section of the toolbar. The icon with three dots should give you this option. We are going to get started today with the caregiver perspective by Jennifer Rexroad, who is the executive director of the California Alliance of Caregivers. And that is going to be followed by our two speakers for educational rights, Jennifer Messerschmidt with the Permanency Services and Support Unit at CDSS, and Abigail Trillin with the Mills Legal Clinic with Stanford Law School. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Jen so she can go ahead and do the caregiver perspective. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. This is such an important topic. Uh, we're really excited about our speakers um, today. Caregivers play such an important role in the educational success of the children and youth in their care. Um, you are all uniquely um, in a position to help and support educational progress. And children and youth really benefit from caregivers who um, can help advocate for their educational needs, whether it be tutoring or getting an education assessment, being in communication with the schools or the foster youth education liaisons. Some of you may have um, or be educational rights holders. Not all caregivers have ed rights. Um, but certainly all caregivers can work with educational rights holders um, in the child and family team and the team meetings. And so we hope that some of this information will help you as you work to support the children and youth in your care. Great, thank you for that, Jen. And I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Messerschmidt. Um, you can go ahead and take it away. And I believe you have the ability to share your screen as well. Hey, thanks so much. Let's start. <clears throat> so good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Messerschmidt. And as mentioned, I'm with the Permanency Services and Support Unit with California Department of Social Services. Today, I'm going to talk about caregivers' role in education. So, an agenda overview today, I'll be going over the education rights holder responsibilities, who may hold education rights, school stability, school of origin, education rights and responsibilities of caregivers, requesting education records. Senate Bill 233, Foster Youth Services Coordinators and Foster Youth Liaisons, Special Education and Foster Youth Education Rights. <clears throat> Before we get started, some, some important statistics to know about so that we can um, improve these statistics for our foster youth is that students in foster care experience much higher rates of school instability than other students. One third of students attend two or more schools during a single school year compared to only 7% of students statewide. Only 19% of students in foster care are proficient or above in English <clears throat> compared to 44% of students statewide and 12% of foster youth score proficient or higher on math compared to 33% of students statewide. Foster youth have the highest dropout rates and lowest graduation rates. The dropout rate for students in foster care is 8% compared to 3% with students statewide. And likewise, only 58% of students in foster care graduate from high school compared to 84% of students statewide. So that's why it's so very important 
that um, our caregivers work together as a team to improve these statistics. You can make a huge difference in a foster youth's life. Education rights holder responsibilities. So education rights holders are individuals with the legal authority to make education decisions and access education records. All youth must have an education rights holders, including infants and toddlers. Education rights holders, except for adoptive parents or legal guardians, cannot consent to services or release information from an outside mental health provider. Contact the legal representative for the youth if access to this information is necessary. Education rights holders have a right to written notice of and or to make decisions regarding school enrollment, including transfers to alternative schools, school of origin, high school graduation, including AB 167 and 216, special education that includes decisions regarding assessments and consenting to an individualized education program known as an IEP, Early intervention, including decisions regarding assessments and consenting to an individualized family service plan, known as an IFSP, school discipline, and mental health services provided through the use IEP. So who may hold education rights? Biological parents retain education rights for their children unless the court limits or terminates their rights. When parental rights are limited or terminated, a court must simultaneously appoint a new education rights holder. Appropriate education rights holders can include foster parents, relative caregivers, court appointed special advocates, and community members who have a relationship with the youth. Adoptive parents and legal guardians automatically hold educational rights. Prospective adoptive parents will automatically hold education rights once parental rights are terminated. Youth automatically hold their own educational rights once they turn 18, but youth 16 years and older have a right to access their own education records. Um, who may hold education rights? So anybody that has a conflict of interest may not serve as an educational rights holder, including social workers or probation officers, group home staff, therapists, attorneys receiving attorney fees, school and regional center staff. Appointing an appropriate educational rights holder at each court hearing, the judge must assess whether the youth currently has an educational rights holder and whether that person is an appropriate educational rights holder. If biological parents continue to hold education rights, there will be no documents to prove this. Uh, but if a court limits or terminates a parent's education rights, then the court will issue a form which can be used as proof of who holds education rights. School stability matters. So foster youth transfer schools on average of six to eight times while in foster care losing four to six months of learning each time. As a result of school instability, only 20%, again, are proficient in English, 6% in math by 11th grade, and fewer than 60% of foster youth graduate from high school. So it's really important to try to keep um, youth in their school of origin. Um, so what is their school of origin? That can include the school the youth attended at the time they entered into the foster care probation system. And maybe the school the youth just most recently attended. It could also be any school the youth attended in the last 15 months that they have a close connection to involving sports teams, relationship with peers or teachers. And school of origin also includes um, their feeder patterns. So if the youth is transitioning from elementary to middle school, our middle schools to high schools, the school of origin will include the next school within the school district's feeder pattern so that they can promote to the next school with their peers. Um, our school of origin FOSS youth have a right to remain in their school of origin is if it is in their best interest as determined by their education rights holder. School of origin is the default before making any recommendation to move a FOSS youth from their school of origin 
The district's foster youth liaison must provide the youth and their education rights holder with a written explanation of how it is in the youth's best interest not to stay in their school of origin. The youth cannot be moved from their school of origin until after a written waiver of this right is obtained by the school district from the education rights holder. Um, scope of the school of origin. So school of origin rights applies to all schools, including magnet programs and charter schools. Duration of these rights. If a youth's court case closes while they're in elementary school or middle school, they still have the right to remain in that school of origin until the end of that current school year. And if the youth is in high school when their case closes, they have the right to remain in their school of origin until they graduate from high school. Transportation funding. So many foster parents, including relatives, are eligible from their local child protective aid services agency if they transport a youth to their school of origin after a placement change. Under the Every Student Succeeds Act, school districts must work with child welfare agencies to ensure a youth is transported to their school of origin. Each school district's Title I plan must include assurances that the district will be collaborating with the state and local child welfare agencies to develop and implement procedures for how transportation to the school of origin will be provided to the youth. And so here's a flyer that um, hopefully explains that. Um, so the rates are to be paid to foster family home providers, including licensed foster parents, approved relatives, certified foster parents, non-related extended family members, resource family. Um, for each foster child whose educational stability plan indicates that the child will be remaining in their school of origin, the travel reimbursement is eligible for youth from grades kindergarten through 12th grade who return to their school of origin. The foster parent reimbursement payment is calculated based on four one-way trips, taking the child to school and back, and the driver back home, and then driving to pick the child up after school and then returning home. This payment is for a 12-month period and payment doesn't stop for any reason other than a physical placement move for the child. This payment requires transport for the child also to extracurricular activities and parent-teacher conferences. Um, so for the rates, it depends how far from uh, the placement home to school you're driving. But starting at from four miles up, there is extra reimbursement monthly that you may be qualified for. Um, there's also public transportation reimbursement if the youth takes the bus. Um, so it's something to speak to your social worker about if you are driving the child to this, their school of origin. Dispute resolution, and if at any time there is a dispute regarding the youth's right to remain in their school of origin, the youth has a right to remain in that school until the dispute is resolved. Disputes should be referred to the school district's dispute resolution process, and a complaint can be filed on the youth's behalf through their Uniform Complaint Procedures Act. Next, we'll talk about requesting education records. So school districts must request records within two business day of a foster youth being enrolled. School districts must forward the education records to the requesting school within two business days of receiving a request. And school districts and local child welfare probation agencies may share education records of students in foster care or on probation without consent of a parent or guardian. School districts must give an education rights holder a complete copy of a youth education record within five business days of request. And school districts cannot hold transcripts, diplomas, or other records of school fees are owed. Uh, reasons to request records. So it's important to get the records of a youth in your care to track their education performance over time, understand the youth's history and current needs, determine interventions that have or have not worked in the past, and comparing past and current testing to monitor academic progress. Your child's education record. So the following changes relative to student records and education information of FOSI have been made by uh, Senate Bill 233 that passed in 2017. It requires the school district to permit access to student records to foster family agencies with jurisdiction over a currently enrolled or former student. 
short-term residential treatment program staff responsible for the education or case management of a student, as well as caregivers who have direct responsibility for the care of the student, including certified or licensed foster parents, approved relatives, non-related extended family members, or a resource family. Um, the Senate bill expands access to student records to include current or most recent records of grades, transcripts, and attendance, discipline, online communication, special education assessments, and any individualized education program or 504 plan. It establishes the right and obligation and extremely important need of caregivers to access and maintain educational information about the child placed in your home, regardless of whether you've been appointed as the student's educational rights holder. Assessing these educational documents, so school districts, counties, office of education, charter schools, non-public schools are all required to grant access to student records to approved resource family caregivers. Uh, again, whether or not they hold educational rights. And during the resource family approval process, caregivers will be provided with training about the expectations for their role in supporting a foster child with their education. Caregivers are obligated to access and maintain educational information about the child and relay information you gather to the educational rights holder when that is someone other than the caregiver. Caregivers should use the information gathered to update the health and education passport and to support the care of the child and their educational needs. Receiving educational documents, caregivers have the right to receive assistance Assessing educational records from the placement agency. Placement agencies should partner with caregivers to ensure that caregivers can obtain their child or use educational information and documentation that confirms their status as approved caregivers. Placement agencies are also responsible for providing caregivers with information about their rights and responsibilities with regard to accessing educational information. If caregivers have any education questions, our follow-up questions from the education training they received during the resource family approval process. Caregivers can contact their child or use social worker or RFA worker um, placement agency, or you can contact the California Foster Care Unsbuds person at fosteryouthhelp at dss.ca.gov. Uh, more about Senate Bill 233. So information for School transfer, including name of last school, grade, achievement level, and any special problems should be included as part of the placement paperwork provided to you by the social worker. Social workers are also responsible for providing to the caregiver the contact information for persons who hold educational rights and the contact information for the nearest foster youth support coordinating program and information about their rights and responsibilities. If these items are not included, ask your social worker to provide this information. This information may also be included in the child's health and education passport. Um, so again, to summarize up Senate Bill 23 um, to 33, regardless of holding educational rights, Schools are required to grant access to student records to approve resource family caregivers. Caregivers should be provided training or are obligated to access and maintain educational information. Caregivers have the right to receive assistance assessing educational records. Education information should be included as part of the placement paperwork provided to you by the social worker, as well as contact information for the person who holds educational rights. Caregivers can contact their child or use social worker or placement agency if they do not receive educational information. Um, next, we'll talk about the foster youth service coordinators. The California Department of Education has administered a statewide grant program since 1981, um, the Foster Youth Services Coordinating Program, known as FYSCP. And FYSCP provides funding to County Office of Education to improve interagency support for students in foster care. So the Foster Youth Service Coordinating Program, um, they're responsible for ensuring that 
Local education agencies are providing supportive educational services to foster children to improve their educational outcomes. Foster children with the greatest need should be first to receive services, particularly foster children residing in out-of-home placements. The Foster Youth Services Coordinating Program is designed to increase stability by providing supports, such as assisting with the transfer of health and school records, emancipation training for independent living, and ensuring that all foster youth educational rights are being upheld for the youth. These services are designed to improve educational performance and personal achievement. And each um, county office of education has a designated program coordinator whose contact information can be found on the CDE webpage. So you can look up the name and number of your county's um, foster youth services coordinating program person. <clears throat> and then there's also the foster youth liaisons. In addition to the foster youth services coordinating program, um, Assembly Bill um, 490 passed to charge school districts, county child welfare and probation agencies, and other professionals with additional responsibilities to facilitate educational equity for foster children. Every school district must appoint a designated staff person as the education liaison for wards or dependent children of the court. So educational liaisons are placed at County Office of Education school districts to ensure and facilitate the proper educational placements, enrollment in school, and transfers between schools for foster children. And a list of all of the liaisons can be found also on the CDE webpage. So you can look up your local school district and look up the liaison's contact information. Special education assessments and services. So for all foster youth with disabilities or those suspected of having a disability, it's especially crucial to identify an appropriate educational rights holder because the educational rights holders must consent to assessments, attend and meaningfully participate in all individualized education program IEP meetings and consent to the IEP document. Um, some important warning signs and things to look out for for foster youth. That means they may benefit from special education services. If, they ha if there are poor grades, withdrawal, depression, acting out or disciplinary problems, poor attendance, inattention or failures to complete work, social skill deficits or failure to make friends. Um, so adults in a foster youth's life can make a referral for special education services. So caregivers, educational rights holders, social workers, mental health providers, and the request must be in writing. After the assessment is requested, school districts must either provide an assessment plan or written refusal to assess within 15 calendar days. The school has 60 days to complete the assessment and hold an initial IEP meeting. Boss youth uh, have other people serving them who can contribute to an IEP meeting, including non-educational rights holder, caregiver, social workers, or other outside mental health professionals. And even if the student is ultimately found ineligible for an IEP, students may qualify for needed services under um, a Section 504. And so your child's educational rights um, so the following are the foster youth education rights. So these were developed in very child-friendly language by the California Foster Youth Education Task Force. Um, so this will summarize the California Education Code sections pertaining to foster youth, because it is important for caregivers and youth to know the educational rights of youth in foster care. Caregivers should be reading and discussing these rights with the youth so that they understand their educational rights. Um, so you'll want to speak to your youth to explain to them that they have the right to remain in their school of origin. They have the right to stay in the same school even after they change placements um, and let them know this could be the school they attended when they first entered foster care, school most recently attended, or school in the last 15 months they feel connected to. School districts have to work with the youth and education rights holder and caregiver and social worker to develop a plan to transport them to the school of origin. When transitioning from elementary school to middle school or middle school to high school, they have the right to transition to the same school as their classmates. 
And if there's any disagreements, they have the right to stay in the school of origin until the disagreement is resolved. Right to immediate school enrollment. So when you move, they have the right to immediately enroll in their regular homeschool. They cannot be forced to attend a continuation school or other alternative education programs, such as independent study, even if they are behind in credits or have discipline problems at school. They have a right to be immediately enrolled in school and begin attending classes, even if they don't have the proper paperwork you normally need for enrollment, like a birth certificate or transcripts, or they didn't check out from their previous school. The previous school must send their education records to their new school after they enroll. And they have a right to participate in any activities available at the new school, such as sports, tutoring, after school clubs, even if they miss tryouts or sign up deadlines. Um, also, you have a right to partial credits for high school students. So if they change schools during the school year, they have the right to partial credits in all classes they were passing when they left their old school. Even if they didn't complete the entire class, after they change schools, the new school has to accept partial credits issued by the old school. And if they change schools, they have the right to be enrolled in the same or similar classes they were enrolled in in their last school. They cannot be forced to retake a class or part of class that they already completed with a passing grade if it makes them off track for graduation. They have the right to take or retake classes they need to go to California State Universities or Universities of California. And their grades can't be lowered if they are absent from school for court hearings, placement changes, or court-related activities. Graduation rights. So youth have the right to stay in their high school for a fifth year to complete their graduation requirements, even if they are over 18. If they're behind on credits and they transfer schools after 10th grade, they may be eligible to graduate under AB 167-216 by completing only state graduation requirements instead of the school district's requirements. And if they're eligible, the decision whether to graduate under AB 167-216 is made by the education rights holder. College rights, so foster youth have the right to have the application fee waived when they apply to a community college in California. They have the right to receive um, the maximum amount of federal student aid, and they may be eligible for 5,000 per year from a Chafee scholarship. School discipline rights, um, so foster youth can't be suspended for more than five school days in a row or for more than 20 days in a year. They have the right to be told why they're being suspended and provide their version of events and evidence before suspension. And if the, the behavior for what they're being suspended for could subject them to criminal charges, they should consult with their education rights holder or attorney before, before providing verbal or written statements to the school or police. Their attorney and social worker must be invited to a meeting before the suspension can be extended beyond five days. And suspension can only be extended if they're being considered for expulsion. They have a right to formal hearing and be represented by their attorney at that hearing before they're expelled. If they're facing possible expulsion, their attorney and social worker must be notified. And if they're in special education, the attorney and social worker must be invited to a meeting to decide whether your behavior was related to your disability. And students have the right to their school records. So they have the right to access the records if they're 16 or older or finished 10th grade. And the social worker, probation officer, and education rights holders can access their school records as well. Um, and if a youth feels their education rights have been violated, they can file a complaint and the school has 60 days to investigate and give them a written response. For more information on how to file a complaint, you can visit the CDE website are called the CDE Coordinated School Health and Safety Office. Um, so in summary, for educational rights, um, youth have the right to remain their school of origin, right to immediate enrollment in school, right to partial credits for high school, rights to graduation and college, school discipline rights, right to their school records, and every foster youth under 18 must have an educational rights holder. Um, so further resources for caregivers, further questions and comments in the future, you can contact the Permanency Services and Support Unit 
at the following phone number or at fostercareeducation at dss.ca.gov. And here's a links to the CDSS resource hub, uh, foster youth services web pages, um, some very helpful toolkits from the Alliance for Children's Rights, um, foster youth education rights, and education law fact sheets. All right, and so thank you so much for joining today. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer Messer Schmidt, for that very informative presentation on educational rights. I, I believe we have a couple questions in the chat, if you don't mind possibly answering a couple. Um, Jen Rexroad, are you available to possibly go um, read, Jen, the questions that you may feel are of most importance since we don't may not have time to go over them all? Yes. Um, here, here, there are a few questions. Um, can the resource parents, if they are sole ed right holders, choose to homeschool a foster child? If the neighbor school neighborhood school in the resource family's neighborhood is full, um, is the school district what required to allow the foster child to enroll anyway? So there are a couple pieces to that. Um, if the resource parents are the sole ed right holders, can they choose to homeschool a foster child? And then the um, next part of the question is, if the neighborhood school in the resource family's neighborhood is full, um, is the school district required to allow the foster child to enroll anyway? Some good questions. Um, well, when making school decisions, yeah, the education rights holder should work with the youth and the social worker and talk it out during a CFT to make the best interest determination for the student on what school is the best for the student involving the whole team is always recommended um, when making decisions on changing schools for the youth. And but, so if if the neighborhood school is full is a does the foster youth have priority can they enroll anyway or um can the district does the district um can the district send them to another school foster youth are to have priority i haven't I don't know for sure. I haven't had that come up a lot. That question come up a lot, actually. Um, but possibly you do have rights and priorities. Um, and if they're not allowing enrollment, yeah, that's something to um, take up with the numbers we have about dispute. If they, yeah, if they're not allowing them to stay in their school origin and or enroll in the best interest determination school, then I would contact and file a dispute. Okay. And then there's one more question. Um, if the child is experiencing high anxiety at the time of placement, is it mandatory to enroll them in school immediately anyway? Mm -hmm. School is important, but that may be an important conversation to have with the child social worker and get services started um, and work as a team on helping the child with their anxiety and attending school. Okay, thank you. Perfect. All right, well, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Abigail Trillin with the Stanford Law School. Good afternoon, Abigail, and you should have access uh, to go ahead and share your screen. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I just wanna say at the outset that some of the materials that I'm gonna go over um, overlap a little bit with Jennifer's presentation. So I'll try to, Go quickly through those, but also just feel free to put questions in the chat as I'm going along. Either I'll jump on into them um, if I can, or um, I'll be sure to save time to the end. I really want to tailor the presentation to be most useful for everyone. Um, so I let's see. Um, okay. Can every uh, let's see. Just want to make sure this can be seen. 
Um, okay. Is everyone able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. I now can't see anyone, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll just go with it. Um, so I, I will need to be interrupted if there's an urgent question. Um, so first of all, just to let you know a little bit about myself, um, my name is Abigail. I am a clinical supervising attorney here at the clinic, uh, Youth and Education Law Project, which is a clinical program at Stanford Law School. So we represent students in special education cases and school discipline cases, primarily in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, but prior to coming to Stanford just about a year ago, I spent 25 years at Legal Services for Children. Um, and so I, um, I spent a lot of time representing children in the education front, but also in child welfare cases. Um, so let's see. Um, so in terms of today, uh, we're going to um, spend a little bit of time just sort of on your role as a caregiver um, and then really try to spend the bulk of our time doing a little bit of a deeper dive on special education, what it is, what the process is, and things to look out for. Um, we probably won't spend very much time on the special rights of foster youth because I think Jennifer covered that extremely well. Um, and again, I cannot now see the chat, but if you do have questions um, that seem like they'd be better answered during the presentation, um, just put them in the chat and maybe Judy or Tremaine or someone can just feel free to interrupt me. Okay. Um, okay. So in terms of your role, I assume most of you in the audience are, care, are caregivers. Um, and I think I, I ask you to really think expansively about your role, um, whether or not you are the educational rights holder. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, the educational rights holder is the parent unless the court says otherwise, right? So the default is even if a child is in foster care, the parent maintains um, educational rights, but the court can appoint a, an educational surrogate if that's not appropriate for whatever reason. Um, I will say that um, sometimes even when a child hasn't lived with their parents for some time, having them remain uh, the educational rights holders can be really productive in terms of kind of a continuing role for the parent, a continuing connection. Um, but other times it can be really not appropriate given you know, the level of involvement of that parent. Um, and in that case, um, you know, as Jennifer mentioned, foster parents can be educational surrogates, CASAs, um, relative caretakers. Um, but I think just one thing I really want to emphasize is that even if you are not the educational rights holder for the young person that you're caring for, even if that person, um, if the parent maybe still maintains the educational rights, or if there's another educational rights holder like a CASA, you still have an incredibly important role to play. And that's why you saw, you know, some of the changes in law about caregivers being able to access records also, because no matter what, as I'm sure you all are experiencing, if a child is in your home, you need to be involved in their educational process, right? You need to know what they're receiving, or you need to know what's happening um, in terms of their special needs or special services. You need to be able to give input, right? Because you're the one who's going to see like, oh my gosh, they cannot do their math homework, right? That's information that you have that needs to be um, brought to the school. So I really encourage you to um, Think about yourself as an educational advocate, regardless of whether you actually have that title of educational rights holder. Um, the other thing I just want, want you to kind of think about is, is involving the social worker. Um, and, and, I, and one thing I really want to stress there is that um, social workers, as you know, and I'm sure have experienced, have high caseloads, right, and are very busy. And so I think it is critical to keep the child social worker in the loop. If, for example, if you're going to request an, an assessment, you're going to ask for an IEP, um, if something's going wrong, whatever it is, um, definitely let them know. But but you, you really, as a caregiver, are going to be in the best position to kind of keep things moving along. It's a, that's a hard thing for a social worker to do kind of with the, with the caseloads that they have and everything else. And so especially if you're the educational rights holder, but even if you're not, you really are the one who kind of has to move that train in terms of getting the, the needs um, of, of the young person that you're caring for met. Um, okay, so what, we, what I really want to spend some time talking about today is special education. 
Um, and I want to emphasize that special education is a very broad array of services. I think a lot of times we tend to conceptualize when we hear the word special education, like we have like a physical place that we're thinking of. Um, and that's really not at least what it is supposed to be. Um, it is, it is the right to specialized education, right? So it, it, it means exactly what it says, right? Specialized education for students with disabilities um, as agreed to in their IEP. And we'll talk a little bit more about IEPs, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean a, a room somewhere, right? It, it means a set of services, a set of specialized educational services um, for that young person. Um, and it can be a really, really wide range of placements and services, right? And from starting from a student who may be has, is in a regular class all day, every day, except you once a week, they get half an hour of speech, right, of, a, of um, speech services, right? So that could be like a very low level of intervention, right? Include all the way up to students who are in a special classroom, special schools, um, and, and even to the kind of the, the most highest level of need are residential placements. Um, so there's some very, very key principles in special education that um, I want to talk a little bit about because these are the principles that should always guide you in your advocacy and should always guide the school and the school district in terms of, of their advocacy. Um, so the first one is the right to a free and appropriate education. And sometimes in the special education wor world that's referred to as FAPE, and, and you might see that for those of you who've attended IEPs, you might see something that on the IEP that says offer of FAPE, right, which is basically this is what the district is offering and what the district believes is a free and appropriate education. And that comes straight from the law where all children with disabilities have a right to a free and appropriate education. Um, and, and so really what that means is that any student with a disability has a right to be educated in a way that is appropriate for them based on their disabilities for free by their school district, right? Um, and so that's a really, really key concept and one that you're going to see again and again um, referred to in the IEP. And again, at FAPE, I find it kind of an odd <laughs> phrase, right? And especially if you don't know what it means, but that that's what it, it basically just means. What is the district offering? What are they saying is appropriate for the, for the young person? Um, another extremely, extremely critical concept is the right to receive that education in the least restrictive environment. And interestingly, I think that um, you, you will often see this a similar concept in the child welfare world, right? So I think we, you know, you know that ideally you want um, children to be in home in at home in home like placements right with relatives and and only when absolutely necessary you're going to are you going to move children to more restrictive placements and the same is true in the educational context right and so really really importantly um the 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 same concept applies that those services that that young person needs should be happening sorry a little bit of a um, in, in the least restrictive environment. Um, so what that means is the district sitting down with you as the caregiver or you as the educational rights holder in school, when you're sitting in that IEP meeting, what the question, th those are the, the, the primary questions that you're asking, right? Like what is an appropriate education for this young person given the disabilities that they may have? And what is the least restrictive way to provide that? And, and another way of thinking about restrictive is sort of least segregated, more most inclusive, right? Because ideally you would like, every, we would like every student to be able to get what they need, regardless of their level of disability, with as much time in a general education classroom with as much inclusion, much which means being included um, with the rest of, of their peers, right? And so, what an IEP is supposed to look at is how can you provide those most appropriate services in the least restrictive environment, right? So the, 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 where is that balance for getting that young person everything that they need to uh, address their disability in a way that takes them out of their, their peer learning as little as possible, right? And so that's always the balance that you're going for. And you'll see if you've sat in IEPs, you'll see 
that discussed, you know, you, you, you actually have to write on the IEP what, what other things were considered to show that you're actually choosing the least restrictive environment because that is the law. Um, another core key concept for special education is this concept of individualized planning, right? And so again, think about it not as some place, some box, some, you know, classroom somewhere that you're trying to see if your student fits in, but what are the individual needs of that young person? and how can we meet those needs. And if you've sat in an IEP before, you see how you look at the individual um, levels of performance of that, per of that young person, the goals, and you try to have a program that meets that need. Um, I will say that as someone who's been um, doing educational advocacy um, my whole career, um, I kind of wish that concept just applied to all students, right? I mean, it really, um, it, it is an, such an important concept for students with disabilities, but it really in so many ways is what all students need and deserve, right? It's something that is, is somewhat tailored to their needs because right? every student is different in the way that they learn. Um, but this is a really, really core part of um, special education law is this concept of individualized planning. And so, for example, you cannot, um, if, if an IEP finds that a student needs a certain kind of service, the, the school can come back and be like, yeah, well, we just don't have that here at this school, so sorry, right? It has to be based on the individual need, then they're going to have to figure out a way to either have that child attend a different school or have that service be brought into that school. You can't kind of just say, well, this is what we have here, you know, pick one of these three options, right, if that's not meeting the individual needs of that child. Um, another really, really, really core piece of the special education law and principles is this concept of parent, caregiver, educational rights holder participation. Um, in some ways, the, the law around special education is, is better on process than on substance, right? In that, that the, the law is very strong in terms of the requirement that parents participate, uh, parents, caregivers, educational rights holders participate in the IEP process, um, you, every step of the way, you need the consent of, of the educational rights holder. So you cannot do an assessment without the consent of the educational rights holder. Then you come in the IEP, you cannot do any services without the educational rights holder. If there's a disagreement about um, services or what should happen, the educational rights holders has a right to appeal that decision. And that's what's called a due process hearing. So there's a lot of kind of procedural protections that are baked into a special education case. Um, what that means is that the, the school and the district do not have total discretion to, to place or provide whatever services they want. That has to be an agreement and the parent or educational rights holder has to be part of that. Excuse me. <coughs> Okay, um, actually, let me just pause for a moment um, to see if there are any questions kind of on some of those general, um, <coughs> sorry, I can't see on the WebEx, I cannot see the PowerPoint and those things at the same time. Um, are there any um, questions that people wanna ask uh, before we kind of go into a little bit more of the nitty gritty on special education? As of now, Abigail, there are currently no questions in the okay. chat for you at this point. All right. Well, then I will I will keep going. Oh gosh, now I seem to have lost. Okay. <clears throat> so, what qualifies a young person to receive special education services? Um, there are some. There are, I believe, fourteen different qualifications, but I'm just going to kind of um, call out some of the most common ones that we see the most often. So, um, one of the most really common eligibility categories is a learning disability. Um, and that's a really broad category. It can mean all kinds of types of processing disabilities, auditory processing, visual processing. <clears throat> Basically, something is getting in the way of the child's learning. And so kind of based on what their intellectual capacity is, they are not um, performing at the level that you would expect. And so something is getting in the way. And so that is generally considered a learning disability. And many, many, many students qualify for special education under this this category. And there are you know, all kinds of different interventions that might be appropriate, kind of depending on the severity of it um, and, and the specific needs of that child. Um, another extremely common category that we see is emotional disturbance. Um, 
it, you know, they changed it from severe, severely emotionally disturbed to emotional disturbance. Really not a huge improvement. I think they could do a lot better, um, but that is that is the legal um, language right now. Um, but all kinds of, you know, significant emotional um, mental health is issues and disabilities um, fall under emotional disturbance. And again, can be um, addressed in a, in a huge variety of ways, depending on the individual needs of the child. Um, intellectual disability, so um, these are young people who uh, whose intellectual disability capacity is very low um, and you know that again can be addressed in a, in a really wide variety of, of ways. Um, speech and language, this is a really common one as I mentioned before where you might see a pretty low level of intervention, right? A lot of speech and language issues can be addressed in um, what's called a pullout um, or a push in. So, you know, maybe the child goes once a week to a different classroom or maybe someone comes into the classroom. Um, but generally, um, it's a pretty specific uh, area of need that can usually be addressed um, with a, a pretty uh, kind of low level intervention in terms of the child not losing a lot of time in the regular classroom. Um, other health impairment is another kind of broad category, um, but what's really important is that ADHD um, and other kind of attention disorders fall under this category. And so um, there are a lot of young people who qualify for special education under the broad category other health impairment um, because they uh, are, have been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and then autism, um, including kind of that entire spectrum, is also a common category. Um, if you're looking at a, an IEP, you, you can usually find, although of course every district does the pages in a slightly different order, so it's not, um, you know, sometimes you have to search around a little bit, you, but at some on some page on the IEP, usually early on, you will see um, an, an area that says disability um, eligibility category, and it's often it will say primary and secondary. So you can qualify under more than one. Um, and in fact, many young people do. Um, you don't have to, you know, and and you you whichever, whatever el eligibility category they put on your IEP, your services are not limited to that, right? So maybe you maybe have a child who has a learning disability and a secondary eligibility category of emotional disturbance, but they actually also have, need, have some speech and language needs. They can still get speech and language services, right? Whatever the, the words, the categories that are picked on that um, IEP do not limit the services. The services, again, going back to the idea of individualized, right, they have to address the individual needs of that child. Um, now, a lot of times people ask, well, what is the difference between special education and 504? Sometimes people call it, say, a 504 plan. Um, so 504 um, is, is shorthand for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, which is a very broad and general anti-discrimination law. So what that act basically says is you cannot discriminate against any person with a disability um, in any public arena, right, including school, and that people with disabilities have the right to accommodations. Um, and so I, I would think of 504 as kind of the catch-all, right? And so if the student that you have that you're caring for has a disability that doesn't hit one of those eligibility categories and again i said they're 14 so you know many of them will but maybe um just based on the on the level of severity um it doesn't it doesn't rise to the level of special education services um and qualifying under the idea which is the federal law that provides for the iep and the special education services it it doesn't mean they're not entitled to some level of accommodation right because they still have some kind of disability that um that that has to be accommodated under federal law. And so uh, an example of this um, would be uh, perhaps a young person who maybe is suffering from some level of anxiety, but not at the level that would necessarily qualify them as emotionally disturbed under the under the um, IDEA, under the special education law. So because of that, um, they might not qualify for an IEP, but they would have the right to special accommodations. Um, so maybe that's taking breaks from class or, or certain things like that that might um, help with that. So um, 
So 504 plans can be really helpful if you have a young person who um, maybe doesn't fit into one of those boxes in the IDEA, however, does have some type of disability that needs to be accommodated. Um, however, a really important thing to keep in mind is that um, unlike the IDEA, which, which is attached to funding, right? So, so schools get a certain amount of dollars depending on how many students they have who have special education services. The 504 um, law is just a very basic anti-discrimination law. It does not have any dollars attached to it, right? And so what you'll see if you look at a 504 plan generally are things that don't cost money, like, oh, Johnny can sit in the front of the class or Susie can walk outside and take a break if she needs to, right? But you're not going to see a lot of services um, because those cost money, right? And so just a general advocacy tip is that if, if the services that your child needs are going to require some resources, that is probably going to need to be an IEP rather than a 504 plan, right? Because you're not going to get significant resources from a 504 plan. Um, special education process, I think Jennifer already touched on this a little bit, um, but very important, um, starts with that request for assessment, right? And again, the, 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 the educational rights holder has to, so anyone can request and get that process started, but the educational rights holder is the one who has to sign off on that assessment, and the district is not allowed to do anything without that sign off. Um, so this piece is really important, if, especially if you are not the educational rights holder, because um, this can be a place where cases get stuck, right? So maybe maybe the social worker or the foster parent asks for, you know, is really worried about how things are going, asks for an assessment, and then that assessment plan comes out and the educational rights holder isn't around or isn't answering someone's call. And so, you know, this is just something to really think through, um, especially when you're thinking about educational rights holders and who that should be. Um, if you, especially in the beginning of this process or really throughout the process, there's just, there's pretty regular need for involvement of the educational rights holder and it can really kind of stop the process in its tracks if you don't have that. And so you wanna make sure that that person's gonna be available. Um, 60 days for an IEP meeting to take place. That's if assessments are needed. So that would be like for the first IEP or for an IEP if you're asking for new assessments. If it's just, um, you're just asking for an IEP because things are not going well and you wanna kind of relook at things, 30 days. Um, the school has 30 days to set one up. Um, very, very important. If the educational rights holder and the school are not in agreement with what should happen, right? So what 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 should those services look like? Should that student be in a special class? Should that student be in a regular class receiving a wide array of, of services? Should that student be in a regular class with an aide to help them be able to stay in their regular class? Um, if there is a disagreement between the school and the educational rights holder, the educational rights holder has the right to appeal that to, through a state appeals process, okay? And those are some of the cases that we do here at in our clinic. Um, and that's really important because um, I think a lot of times in these IEP meetings, it's it's really hard to feel as a, as a caregiver um, like you have power. Um, you walk into the room, there are a lot of people in the room with a lot of expertise, they're throwing acronyms around and, you know, maybe going really quickly, uh, you know, it, you are you you are walking to a room where a lot of people have a lot of expertise, and it's really easy to feel like you're just supposed to say yes to everything. But but keep in mind that you are the one with the expertise on the young person, right? Um, whether that is a young person who you're related to, who has been in your home for a long time, or maybe um, a young person who might be newer to your family, but whom you you've been been living with and and working with and and you know and talking to their social worker and other people in their life, and you, so you you have a voice. You should have a voice in that meeting, and you also have have a have something in your back pocket, which is that if you if you do disagree, you have the right as an educational rights holder to have. A hearing officer look at that decision. Um, most cases that are brought through the hearing process actually settle in mediation and often um, through that process the educational rights holder and student are able to get you know something that that is acceptable and better you know what really what they close much closer to what they wanted than what was recommended at the IEP. So just you know keep that in mind you are not without power and you are certainly not without expertise to bring to the table in that meeting. 
Um, generally, uh, once an IEP is in place, um, then unless you, you know, need to ask for one more quickly because something's going wrong or unless the child changes schools, in which case they have to do what's called a transition IEP, but otherwise they must still happen every single year. And this is super, super important because every year you have to look at the goals that you set in the IEP and what happened, right? Were those goals met? If you um, are coming up to the year and none of the goals have been met and you're going to put all the same goals back, something is not going well, right? And you need to adjust. You should not just put the same goals and say, ooh, better luck next time, right? You have to adjust the IEP, adjust the services to be more tailored to actually meet the needs of that young person. Um, the assessments are every three years, again, unless you request them to happen more quickly. Um, that's why they're called the triennial assessments. Um, there is a process by which the educational rights holders can waive the right to triennial assessments. I think that there's a lot of pressure on um, caregivers to do this. Um, you know, schools, districts are say, oh, we're really busy. It'll delay the IP, et cetera, et cetera. I, I really, really strongly recommend against waiving your right to assessments. Um, three years is actually a very long time in the life of a young person and things can really, really change in terms of their um, abilities and needs. And uh, so I really, really encourage you to um, make sure those assessments happen at least every three years. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that if, there, um, if, you, if you are concerned about the assessment, if you feel like it really isn't capturing something, it's missing something, or you just disagree with the recommendations, you do have the right to ask the district to do an independent assessment, to pay for an assessment to be done outside the district. They can say no, and you can bring that question to a hearing, right? But you absolutely have the right to make that request. And sometimes they'll, you know, just say yes um, versus going to a hearing on that issue. So that's something to keep in mind also if you just don't agree. And the assessments really vary. And I've seen so many assessments in my career from, you know, the ones that are really comprehensive and really well done to ones that, you know, are not. Um, so you, you just want to make sure you're getting a really good picture. A um, couple just uh, kind of uh, key issues just to be on the lookout for, or maybe red flags. Um, refusal to assess, right? Uh, again, districts are busy, um, but they have to assess a student based on the request of the educational rights holder. And they, it's not an excuse to say, oh, well, we don't know this child very well. They've just, you know, they've only been here. Um, not very long. Well, that, I mean, if that is an excuse to not assess, then no kids in foster care are going to get assessed, right? And that cannot be okay. So that's not an excuse. Um, there are kind of things that schools will try to do sort of in, in the interim, like, oh, well, why don't we have a student study team meeting? Or why don't we have a 504 meeting? You can do that, right? There's no harm to sitting down um, for a uh, one of these meetings that's going to maybe put some kind of services in place, but not special education services, which you cannot get without that assessment and that IEP. But if you're pretty sure that something is not going well, no, <laughs> just go for the assessment. They, you know, they can do that SST and 504 plan in the meantime while they're doing the assessment, maybe put some interim things in place. That's fine. But don't don't let them use that as an excuse not to do an assessment. Um, it's really, really important. And so many kids in foster care have not had the opportunity to be assessed because they've moved around so much. So if you have a young person in your home and they're finally going to be at a school long enough to have a full assessment, please, please, please don't let them kind of stall on that. Um, Another kind of red flag to just look out for that I feel has been really prevalent since the pandemic, I, I think that the pandemic, because everyone had to be on Zoom school for, you know, some fairly long period of time, sort of lowered everyone's um, expectation or, or maybe raised everyone's sort of acceptance of the, this concept of online school. Um, but what we learned and what has been all over the, the newspaper recently is that it didn't work for most students at all, right? And that almost all students in California regressed tremendously during online school in addition to all the other kind of mental health and, and related issues. Um, and so it, it's really not okay to push students just because we all went to Zoom school for some period of time does not mean that's okay for students to go to Zoom school. Um, all students have the right to be in in-person school. They cannot force a student into online school um, for any reason, right? For um, for behavior, um, it, for the type of placement they're in, you know, you can't say, oh, well, now this student is is in a resident in a short-term residential, so we're just gonna put them online school. No, 
um, every student has the right to be in person regular school um, or whatever program is appropriate based on their IEP. Um, and that should never say online school, right? Um, I, although I think to answer one of the questions that came up in the chat previously, there are clearly young people whose mental health is suffering so so significantly and maybe their level of anxiety is so high that they might not be able to go to school that first you know week that they're placed with you or even that first month um that's a that's hopefully a temporary situation that maybe can be addressed with something like home hospital instruction where the student is receiving something temporarily at home but again just until their mental health is such that they can attend school that should never be kind of like oh well this child has behavior issues so we're just going to put them on home you know online school or independent study that's never ever ever appropriate um, and then the final thing I really want you all to kind of be on the lookout are issues of school discipline. Um, and as Jennifer talked about, there are, um, you know, relatively new rights in terms of um, uh, caregivers, um, educational rights holders, social workers, probation officers, attorneys for kids in foster care and probation being notified when school discipline events are taking place, like a recommendation for expulsion. Um, but very, very important to, um, to know in the context of special education and 504 is that students cannot be expelled if the behavior was related to their disability. So this is super, super important. Um, if a student if a, acts out in some way that might cause the school to rec recommend expulsion, the school first has to have a meeting and look at whether the behavior um, was a result of their disability. Um, and that's called a manifestation determination because they're, they're trying to determine whether the behavior was a manifestation of the disability, right? And so you could see with a child who's maybe their eligibility cat category is emotional disturbance, that's gonna be a pretty easy call, right? Most of that behavior is gonna be a manifestation determination. With students with other types of disabilities, you, it might be uh, more of an argument, but often you can tie behavior to a disability. That is often the reason why students are acting out. Um, and this law protects students with IEPs, but it also protects students with those 504 plans that we talked about. And it protects students who should have one of those things, but the school missed it, right? And that is really important, especially for you all to keep in mind, because that happens all the time with kids in foster care, because they've been bouncing around from school to school. And so no one got around to assessing them for special education. And then lo and behold, they get in trouble because they're not receiving the services that they need. And that's a really important time to say, nope, we're not going full speed ahead with this expulsion process. First, we have to look at the disability and special education needs of this child to determine what's going on. Do they have a disability? And did that disability cause this behavior? And if so, the expulsion needs to stop and an IEP process needs to start. Um, I'm not going to talk about the special rights of foster youth because I think Jennifer covered that really comprehensively. Um, and so I um, will share this um, later so you have all those resources, but want to take an opportunity if we have time for any questions. So we have several questions in the chat, and I'll just remind everyone to add your questions now if you um, have one. There was um, one question about if anxiety or depression would be a qualifier for emotional disturbance. Yes, definitely. Um, absolutely. That is, is absolutely one of the ways that students qualify. Um, it has to be so if you look at the way that the eligibility categories are defined, they it has to be sort of at a certain level. Um, and specifically, it has to interfere with school is one of the things, um, but also it has to be at a certain level of severity, right? And so absolutely, there are many young people who um, qualify for special education um, because of anxiety or depression. And then there are other children who maybe are experiencing it to a lesser extent who might, for example, qualify for a 504 plan, right? And again, you really want to look at, and, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge too that there are pros and cons to both, right? I mean, I think that um, for some young people, they really may not want special education services. There is still, unfortunately, a lot of stigma attached to that. And you may find that um, the, um, 
a 504 plan is sufficient, right? Um, and you may find that it's not necessary. But you also really want to look at what is the level of support that that young person needs. Um, you know, do they need some time in a in a um, in a therapeutic classroom? Do they need um, school related mental health services? Um, do they need something that's going to take some resources? In which case, you really do want to try through the IEP process. Okay, thank you. And another question is. Is it possible to have um, a student with um, Asperger's or on the autism spectrum enrolled in both a public and a private school? So um, let me first say that there are two kinds of schools that are, um, well, there, there's a type of school that is referred to as a non-public school, which is, you know, by definition, private, but is sometimes different of what some people think of as a private school. So it a little bit depends on which kind of private school. So, so for some um, students, there are some students, and you remember we talked about there's kind of this continuum of services under special education from like something very, very minor, like, you know, once a week speech to a special school, right? And so sometimes there are students whose disabilities are significant enough that they actually cannot be served in a regular public school, not even it's not it's more than even they need a special classroom they actually need a special school and so there are schools called non-public schools that are actually not part of the regular public school district but that districts will contract with to provide those services to students who cannot whose needs cannot be met in the regular school um, <coughs> so uh, I think it is possible I haven't personally seen it but I don't see why it wouldn't be possible for that to be like a half day program and then the student spends part of the day um, in their regular public school, maybe for certain classes. I think that's certainly possible. Again, IEPs are supposed to be individual, so that's what actually meets the needs of the student. I think that'd be possible. Now, if you're talking about a private school that doesn't have any relationship with the school district, like doesn't contract the school district, it's like completely outside of that, maybe a parochial school or a, what they call independent school, um, I think that could be a little bit more complicated um, in terms of because a, a school district can't tell one of those schools to do anything, right? And so it's a little harder to kind of fit that into an IEP. So that might be a little bit more of a complicated situation, so. Okay. And then um, another question, if a child has OT on the IEP, but the school says that they don't have um, an occupational therapist, um, but they're looking for one, does the school have an obligation to make up this time or find another resource? Yeah. So I love this question because this is, this is, yes, <laughs> this is exactly the problem that, um, that caregivers face so often and, and where the, where you just get that, like, yeah, well, yeah, but we don't have that person. And, and you know, I mean, in, to schools, you know, to beds, there are huge staffing shortages right now, but, but the answer is yes. It, so IEP, you have to really think of an IEP as a contract, right? Like if you had a contract with someone to fix your dishwasher, they got to fix your dishwasher, right? So that's what an IEP is. An IEP is a contract between the educational rights holder and the school district and the school to provide a set of services. And if it has been determined that what your child needs is occupational therapy and that gets put in their IEP, then the school has to provide it. And either they have to, if they don't have someone at their school, then they're going to have to, you know, have someone come in from a different school or bus your child over to that other school once a week. Or, and if it takes them a bunch of time to do it, they owe you those back hours, right? And so, um, for example, I had a client last year who missed a lot of speech hours um, during COVID, during remote school, because the speech teacher didn't seem to understand the whole Zoom. <laughs> you know, there was just a disaster on on Zoom. And so, um, so so he was entitled to make up all those hours the following year and he got double speech for a whole year um so that's really important um yes there are staffing issues there are resource issues but kind of too bad and they they really do have to find a way to make it work and make up time um lost if, if there was a delay and that's called comp ed or compensatory ed if they have to make up time that they didn't provide to you um okay it looks like oh oh the question on homeschooling yes okay 
Yeah, so homeschooling is actually a really uh, complicated and interesting topic, especially in California. So there's actually not such a thing as there's not a homeschooling law in California. And there's a lot of um, uh, so the, the, the only way that parents, including foster parents, can homeschool well, there's two ways that family that parents can homeschool a child. Um, one is to basically create a school. So sometimes parents will kind of come together and create a small school um, that, uh, and then try to get that, you know, approved. Or um, parents can do independent study, right? And so th those are kind of the two avenues. There's not there's not something technically in the law called homeschooling in in California. There is in a lot of other states. Um, and so. Um, on independent study, um, there's the law on independent study is that you cannot place a child with special education in independent study without an IEP, unless that's on their IEP, right? So you could not, as a as an educational rights holder or as the caregiver, decide that you're going to have a, a child at home on independent study um, without that being put in their IEP. And so that would involve the whole IEP team, which wouldn't necessarily involve the social worker, although again, that's usually good practice, right? And that's usually very helpful. And certainly, you know, in terms of placements like remaining smooth, um, it's good to keep the social worker involved in, in, you know, certainly a big decision like that. But it actually would involve, you know, others on the IEP team too, right? Like the, the school where they are now and whether, um, so there does, there does need to be a conversation um, at the IEP team level before a child can be on independent study, which is generally the way that a child engages in homeschooling. Um, so it is a different, um, yeah, I mean, which is definitely, um, you know, again, being taught at home by a credential teacher is different from being on being on online school, right? Obviously, uh, um, but um, so that might actually be something that the IEP team determines is in the best interest of the child, especially, um, you know, we talked earlier about issues around anxiety and, and school um, school anxiety. Um, so, but again, the, the whole IEP team should look at that and kind of look at like, you know, in terms of the things you don't get at home, the social skills, those pieces, you know, do that balancing as part of that team process. Um, and yes, if a child's recovered from surgery at home, yes. So if a child cannot go to school because of a temporary medical issue, and that can include a mental health issue, but certainly can include, you know, broken leg surgery, um, they have the right to home hospital instruction, HHI, um, in or and they are have the right to like an hour a day at home from a teacher um, and the work and all of that. But just super important to keep that separate from this idea of um, so that just that the, really really critical is that HHI is temporary, right? So it's based on I just had surgery, I you know broke my leg, I can't go to school. Um, or, you know, having, you know, just came out of hospitalization, severe, severe mental health, right? As opposed to, and I, and unfortunately have seen school districts try to use it as like, oh, this kid has behavior issues. Let's put them on HHI. That's a completely inappropriate and illegal use of HHI. So that should not ever happen. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it does. There, there was one question, um, uh, in the chat um, prior to this about um, a time frame that OT services or services in an IEP must start. So I guess um, from when the IEP is signed, if there's a delay, what, what, uh, when did they need to begin? Or if there's compensatory services, when do they backdate to? Yeah, they are supposed to start immediately. And usually, if you'll see on the services page of the IEP, it will say the service, for example, OT, it'll say the frequency twice a week for 30 minutes, whatever that is. And then it will say the, the time period. And it will usually be from the date of the IEP for one year, because the idea is, you know, every year is supposed to have a new IEP. Um, I guess, you know, it is conceivable that you, the IEP team could agree, okay, well, we know for sure that we don't have someone here, so we're going to actually put that service to start in a month to give the district time. You know, I don't know if I would agree to that as a parent, but, you know, but, but otherwise, you know, whatever's in the IEP, which usually is the date of the IEP or the, you know, the next day, um, that's when it's supposed to start and that's when the comp ed services should be from. 
because you think about it, if the IEPT determines that you need that service, you don't need it in a month. You kind of need it like right now. So. And how can we advocate for a child in a DDMI institution to receive an education that's appropriate? Um, so can I maybe get a little more clarification? Is this maybe someone is educational rights holder of a child who's not living with them, who's in a residential? Um, so I guess, um, well, maybe I'll just try to answer it this way. I think that um, really critically, if you are an educational rights holder, it is your right and your actual responsibility to advocate for the young person to have the educational services that are in their IEP or to have a new IEP if the services are not appropriate. Um, and, and that shouldn't change based on where they are, right? Unless it, unless, you know, if, 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 the, if the services were not working in a, in a certain, let's say in a school and the child ultimately goes to a, um, a residential school, uh, a residential treatment program based on, you know, significant mental health issues, for example, then, you know, by nature, the services are going to change and you're going to have a new IEP. But, but assuming that the educational needs don't change, th then the IEP shouldn't change and where you are shouldn't impact um, what, you know, what your placement is. So, for example, um, if, uh, you know, again, this is something that we've seen is children going to a short term residential treatment program, which, you know, despite the name are not super short term, right? We're not talking about, you know, a month. Um, and then being told, well, okay, well, our program doesn't, you know, we don't actually like to transport kids. So we're all just going to have school here on the computer. That is not okay, right? Each of those children, child, and it, there actually is, is clear state law that children in short-term residential treatment programs, group homes of any kind, have the right to go to their regular school in that school district or their school of origin, whichever um, you know is decided in the best interest. And so, the placement itself, where a child is living, should not determine the IEP. Um, what could determine a new IEP or a new um, set of educational services are if the educational program is not going well and not working. But if the child is, um, the, the, the IEP process, I guess to, to kind of answer the basic question, is the, the mechanism to advocate for a, a child in any institution to receive an appropriate education is the IEP process, whether that's calling a new ed IEP, whether that's filing a complaint, if they're not following the IEP or threatening to file a complaint, which sometimes can be effective. Um, but it, that IEP, just really keep in mind that IEP is a contract. It is a legal document. It is a contract, which means that if it's being violated, you can file a complaint and or you can you can demand the, the compensatory ad and so that is your best tool as an advocate is that iep if that makes sense and one more how many hours of home hospital must be provided per week by the school district i think it's one hour a day um but i'm not 100 percent. but i'm pretty sure it's one hour a day Okay, that looks like all of our questions. Thank you. Um, so I'm happy to share uh, the PowerPoint um, with Tremaine to share with the group and there are some additional resources, although there are a lot of great ones on Jennifer's too. So you'll have a lot of websites to, to explore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abigail. That was a very informative presentation as well. Uh, I just want to say thank you to our presenters and thank you, Jen uh, Rexwell, for joining us today to give that CAC perspective. And this is going to uh, wrap up our webinar on educational rights. Our next webinar will be scheduled towards the beginning of next year, and we're aiming for January. So again, thank you everyone for your participation and thank you for all the participants out there that joined us today. And have a great uh, rest of the day. Enjoy your weekend and enjoy your Thanksgiving next week. Bye, everyone.